How's it going, everyone? My name is Michael SK, and welcome back to Amatsutsumi. So we're in a little bit of a bind here. A very interesting situation, if you will. Mana has had enough of Makoto's, uh, whatever you want to call it. I guess his uh, fascination with the outside world and the, the deep connections that he's making with the people here, she's not on board with it. So she has decided to put a bunch of Kododamas on Makoto that are all wrapped up into one big old Kododama that basically makes it so he cannot perceive anyone else except for Mana. He can't even use Kododamas on Mana. And Kododamas have been applied to Azuki and Kokoro so that they can't even perceive the two of them. So, in a way, Makoto is truly in a world of his own. Though probably not a good idea to go outside because then we'll just run into a bunch of people and not even realize it. Or die. So, let's not do that. But a very interesting situation and very lonely, in a way. In a very obvious way, of course. But right now we're just talking with Mana, not pleading for her to get rid of the Kododama, just talking with her. Oh, that's right. She just told her, or she told us the backstory of, uh, I guess, when Nozomi died. I thought we were going to get a backstory. I was wrong. When she's finished, I'm left speechless. Her voice is a murmur now as she reminisces. I guess... I guess what was just told was what we saw in the beginning of her story arc. When we just switched over to her stuff, it was a quick glimpse at when Nozomi died. I think that is what just got told. I never knew. When Nozomi died, I was sick with the same disease too. By the time I was out of the woods and back to full health, her funeral had already come and gone. From how the adults behaved... I got the impression that her death was something I shouldn't mention. Though I felt troubled by it, I avoided mentioning her death to Mana, and she avoided mentioning the death of my parents. Plus at the time, having just become an orphan, I was still processing my grief and worry about the future. But now that I know that Nozomi explicitly entrusted me to Mana, it all makes sense. It was not just her own feelings for me, but the ones that she inherited from Nozomi as well that led her to do so much for me over the years. She holds her hand up to the stream of falling snowflakes and smiles faintly. Mana. Of course. I do as I'm told, gently putting my arm around her and drawing her to my chest as I stroke her hair. Uh, the silken feel of it under my hand is the same as it's always been. Mana lets out a small, relaxed sigh. It does. Since we were young, we'd often simply sit together, embracing each other like this, without talking, without doing anything. For one thing, I always wanted to help warm her cold body, and anyway, we were both lonely and had only each other for comfort. And eventually, our embraces became more carnal. You should take a nap. Her small, cute yawn tells of the wariness she must feel from this morning's Kododama. Not like we can do much else. Yeah, of course, if you want me to, I'll hold you forever and ever. <sighs> she puts her own arm around me too and hugs me tight as if clinging to me for support. <laughs> Yours is colder than ever. But I'm grateful for the cold. It keeps my mind clear and my feelings vivid. Good night, Mana. Okay, so I was talking about this in the end of the last episode. It doesn't seem like the mutual, or the feelings are mutual. It, it doesn't necessarily seem like that, but Makoto obviously feels for her. He has some sort of deep connection to her. 
My dog is making noises, and so am I. But um, yeah, something to think about. It may not be deep ass like in love with her, but he definitely cares for her and will do whatever it takes to make sure that she's happy, which is probably why he's not angry about this whole situation. Or a part of it. By the time Mana wakes up, sunset is approaching. Along the way, I dozed off a little bit too. It felt like mere minutes, but the day is mostly gone. <sighs> she stirs in my arms and slowly opens her eyes. Good morning, Mana. Did you sleep well? <sighs> oh man, I, I dreamed during my nap earlier today and... I think I also had some sleep paralysis. And that shit is just lovely when the demon comes out and everything. How do you feel? <laughs> Suddenly she looks out the bedroom door towards the staircase. What's wrong? <laughs> and it's already that late, huh? Mana must have heard Kokoro saying I'm home, but I can't hear her any more than I could this morning. Amana's Kododama is still in full effect. She stands up, opens the door, and starts talking to thin air. Kokoro must be standing there. Her excuse for skipping school must have that... Or must have been that she had come down with something. In reality, she is suffering from exhaustion from the Kododama, so it's not really a lie. She sticks out her hand. She's probably patting Kokoro on the head, I guess. I instantly manage or imagine Kokoro's face under Mana's hand, looking a little ticklish but also smiling happily. Kokoro must be talking about me now. She must be worried for me since she hasn't seen me all day. <laughs> she laughs and then waves goodbye to the empty air. Kokoro must have gone downstairs again. What did she say? Mana's mood is much lighter than it was this morning, but she clearly has no intention of changing her mind. Yes. As long as she's saying that, there's no point in thinking about Kokoro. Of course, I'm sure that the longer this goes on, the more worried Kokoro, Azuki-san, and the others will get. Right now, I just need to do everything I can to obey Mana's wishes and convince her to end this. She smiles trustingly. Yeah, I think it's more than just trying to convince her. I think we actually have to do something here. Something a little bit more meaningful than just trying to scrape on by. What that is, I personally have no fucking idea. But yeah, the sooner the better. When there's not a lot of characters around, it's more talking for me. Alright, so we're at the village. What's going on here? It sure is hot. Before speaking, I stopped walking and looked around carefully to make sure nobody was watching. It's scary how deeply habits can lodge themselves in your mind. There was practically no chance that a harmless sentence like that could become a dangerous Kododama after all. But regardless, I always instinctively looked around to make sure that I was home or that I was alone before I said a single word when outside the house. Whew. I quickly wiped the sweat from my forehead and looked up at the sky. It was clear and very blue, with nothing to block the sun's rays. Just standing outside was enough to make me break into a sweat. Uh, maybe I should have said a kododama to myself after all. Maybe something like, it's not hot. However, I closed my mouth firmly and resumed walking homeward. I've been planting in the fields since this morning, but I'd finished sooner than I anticipated. Each year closer to adulthood, I could tell that my body was growing stronger and my work efficiency was increasing. 
But as I grew up, I needed more and more food as well. I noticed again how hungry I was. I thought about the lunch that Mana was probably already making at home and hastened my steps. Wait, they live together? I don't remember. Like, we were here like one time in the backstory. In the very, very beginning. As I entered the doorway, Mana was already there to greet me with a smile. Thanks. For the last few years, her relationship with her parents has deteriorated, so she would often come around to my place. Gotcha. As a rule, we villagers avoided saying anything but the bare minimum to each other, but between family members it was different. And yet, from what she told me, barely a word was spoken in the Koizuka household these days. She often complained to me how she, er, about how stifled she felt there. Holy shit, I was so thirsty there. I was actually struggling to talk. I don't know why I'm so thirsty. Hmm. Everyone knew that we were bethrothed, so nobody paid much mind to her visiting me so frequently. And of course, I had no objection if visiting me was what she wanted to do. Most of all, she, when she was visiting, we could talk to each other freely, unlike when we met outside. I've been living alone since my parents died, so I was happy just to have someone to talk to. At the same time, though, I was worried about Mana's poor relationship with her parents. Yeah, it went a lot smoother than usual today. Usually there would be various inter interruptions, like finding water snakes and having to spend time hunting them down. But luckily, there was nothing like that today. <laughs> Mana glanced toward the back of the house and chuckled. Thanks. Sorry. Such things never bothered me when I was living by myself, so I wasn't in the habit of paying attention to them. I didn't used to clean or organize my house much, but recently Mana has started doing it for me once in a while. Apparently her parents told her to do, or to at least help out with my housework if she was going to be spending so much time here. She opened the lid of the pot, squinting through the burst of steam that escaped. The smell of freshly cooked rice wafted past me, and my stomach growled softly in response. <laughs> she looked at me and chuckled in amusement. Well, this isn't necessarily the backstory I was expecting, but I guess it's welcomed. Whatever allows us to, like, learn more about Mana, to see her more as a, uh, a likable character, I suppose. Seconds, please. I was so hungry that I devoured my whole bowl of rice in a few instants. <laughs> Mana put down her own food and served me another helping of rice. <laughs> Thank you. I brought the bowl to my mouth without even letting it touch the table. Working in the fields always made me very hungry. <laughs> she watched me eat, impressed. But she was quite a big eater for a girl. Uh, her rice bowl was almost empty too. Yeah, for some reason, I feel like I can just keep eating and eating today. She looked over at the crate where I stored my dry rice. My rice was being consumed much faster now that Mana had started eating here, so she would sometimes bring more rice from her house to help out. Can you really do that? You brought me some rice just the other day. Is there enough rice in your house for your parents to eat? She rolled her eyes while scraping a last spoonful of rice from the bottom of her bowl. She really did seem to be on very bad terms with her parents. How did it come to this? I'd often wondered. But Mana didn't seem to want to talk about it, so I had avoided prying too much. It was likely a series of small disagreements that piled up, but in the end there was one obvious cause looming large. Nozomi's death in the epidemic. Mana's parents truly loved Nozomi. That's not to say that they neglected Mana, but Nozomi was special to them. The strength of her Kododama was incredible, 
even at a young age, and she was bright, cheerful, and positive, er, and a positive girl, loved by all. She was a real-life prodigy. Everyone knew that she was the village's bright, shining hope for the future. Of course, both I and Mana, uh, Nozomi's younger twin sister, loved her dearly too. Excuse me. <clears throat> and yet now she was gone, taken suddenly by the epidemic. I could only imagine how vast the trauma and grief suffered by Mana and her parents were. Even I was in shock for quite a while after I heard the news. <laughs> Mana served herself more rice and continued to eat silently. She was never very talkative, even when we were much younger. She wasn't quite an introvert, but she didn't go out of her way to talk to others. She was more the type to let Nozomi do the talking while she looked on from a few steps behind. But now that Nozomi was gone, Mana found herself needing to stand up front, without anyone to defer her, or to defer to. Mana, who used to be the second most powerful Kododama user in the village, was now the most powerful one. And since Nozomi and I had been betrothed, Mana became the only remaining girl who could take Nozomi's place by my side. Her chopstick stopped moving as she turned to me. What? What is it? I put my rice bowl down too and looked back to uh, back back into her eyes. God damn. She spoke lightly, but I could tell she was serious. And as I thought about the deeper meaning of what she said, I found myself unable to answer immediately. Well, if you want to, I don't mind, but I chose my words carefully in my head before continuing. There was no problem at all in letting her stay the night at my house. The two of us were betrothed to each other, which was why it was fine for us to spend all day together too. So even if staying the night involved something sexual, that would be between the two of us and nobody else would object. Our, our people are, are relatively in infertile, so if anything the others would be happy if we could bring a new child into the world. But, why so suddenly? That is what worried me. Although recently she had been spending most of her time in my house, she would always leave and go back to her own house to sleep at night. If she stopped even going back to them at night, wouldn't her tenuous ties to her family finally be severed for good? Yeah, of course, I had no right to pry too deeply into the affairs of the Koizuka family. But it pained me to see that Mana was not getting along with what remained of her family since I myself had lost my entire family in the epidemic. She put down her rice bowl. No, no, they wouldn't think that. I knew her parents weren't the type of people to wish death upon their own child. Well, hopefully no parents were. No, what they surely must be wishing was that both Nozomi and Mana were still alive. Sadly, that hope can never be fulfilled. They're your own flesh and blood. They're your family, so you should treasure them while you can. She sighed. Well, that's one way to put it, I guess. Not exactly picky. I just think it would be a waste to let your to let yourselves become estranged. Once you lose your family, you can't get them back again. And she should have known that since she had already lost Nozomi forever. She gazed at her chopsticks balanced on top of her bowl. Mana, what she said struck a chord in my heart. No, no, you're not imposing at all. I'm always happy to have you here with me. I hastily shook my head. If you really can't stand to be in your parents' house, you can stay here as long as you like. But if there's still a sliver of hope that you might repair your relationship with them, 
All I can say is there's no need for you to take that final step of cutting them off yourself. Eventually, death brings an end to all relationships. But until then, there's no reason to shut the door prematurely. Her expression softened as she picked up her bowl and chopsticks again. Huh, well there we go. The sun slowly made its way down from Zenith, and eventually, evening arrived. <laughs> we weren't doing anything, just sitting side by side and enjoying each other's company. The breeze blowing in from the window had become cooler and it felt nice on my cheeks. It was quiet. It'll be sundown soon. I murmured into Mana's ear, her head resting on my shoulder. <laughs> she nodded slightly, but made no move to get up. You're not going to head back? Nights in the village were pitch dark. It was hard to see where you were going in the darkness, so Mana would always leave before the sun set. <laughs> she shook her head slightly, but she didn't lift her head from my shoulder. <laughs> oh, is she going to make that night run? She put her arms around me and hugged me tight, like a child clinging to its parent. I returned her embrace, stroking her back with one hand. I just wished that she could find peace. Well, that's kind of the plan, isn't it? We've always been very close. It's almost the same thing. And we're betrothed to each other. Eventually, we really will be family. <laughs> she suddenly looked up at me, a pleading expression on her face. Well, I, I suppose you're also the only one. Her tone was unusually weak. Her voice even seemed to be trembling. I looked down at her. I could see the uncertainty shimmering in her eyes. If I didn't want you, I wouldn't be doing this. I, I hugged her tighter. You're more precious to me than anyone else in this village. As she brought her cheek closer to mine, I could smell the sweet fragrance of her hair. My heart jumped at the sensuality of her approach. At our ages, we had long since begun to grow interested in sexual things, of course. But until now, we still hadn't crossed that line. Oh man, we really are in a backstory. Since we were betrothed, the time to or consummate our relationship would naturally arrive one day, we thought, or at least I did. But conversely, maybe we always thought of our betrothal as something about the future and not today. Her fingertip traced the outline of my cheekbone. The uncertainty shimmering in her eyes dissipated as a burning heat grew to take its place. Mana. Something deep in my breast told me that the time had finally come. What is Windows? Windows is doing something. I can see the loading symbol again. I swear, whenever that comes up when I'm recording, it's never anything good. It, not even when I'm just recording, just in general. Mana nodded and then opened her lips. Uh-oh. No way we can get around that now, can we? Does that mean that we have something to skip through? No, we're, we're back home. My eyes open. I look around at the clock, it's the same time I usually wake up. It's impressive how deeply uh, habits can lodge themselves in your mind. <sighs> at my side, Mana stirs, frowning lightly in her sleep. Her hand is tightly clasping the sleeve of my shirt. It's as if even in sleep she doesn't want to let me go. I place my other hand over hers and squeeze it softly. <laughs> A smile of relief breaks across her face as she lets go of my sleeve and squeezes my hand instead. I think back to the first time we slept together, that night I was just now dreaming of. That night all through our first awkward attempt of sex, she never let go of my hand. I stroke her hair watching her sleep for a time, but she continues to show no signs of waking. She must still be very tired from speaking that Kododama yesterday. I would like to escape from this situation as soon as possible, partly out of concern for her health. What should I do now? Normally, I'd get out of bed and go downstairs to make breakfast. 
but in my current situation, that would be difficult. I can't perceive Kokoro or Azuki-san, and they can't perceive me either. If I mess with anything in the kitchen, I could cause trouble for them. If we happen to bump into each other while one of us is handling a blade or something hot, someone could even be injured. No, I have to be very careful when doing anything right now. Still though, I am pretty hungry. Last night, Azuki-san didn't make any dinner for me, so Mana shared hers with me along with some donuts Kyoko brought her. But that wasn't enough to keep me full through the night. <sighs> Mana is still sleeping peacefully. It would be a little sad to wake her up now. No, very sad. I'd like to get my breakfast without relying on her if possible. That's it. I have an idea and slowly slide out of bed. I fear for whatever this idea may be. After changing my clothes and going downstairs, I find that nobody is there as I expected. I can't sense anyone's presence at all. Mana's Kododama is clearly working just as well as it was yesterday. It really is amazing. If I tried a Kododama like that, I'm sure it would have started to falter by now. Hmm. I plot a course to the front door from memory that will hopefully avoid bumping into Kokoro and Azuki-san where they usually stand. Well, if we accidentally bump into them, it'll it'll be alright, I, I suppose. They'll just, uh, be really scared, maybe. I don't know if I managed not to bump into them, but I make it outside to the street. Just like yesterday, the sky is bracingly blue and the street is totally empty, with not a person to be seen or heard. I almost feel like I have the whole town to myself, but of course, that's not actually the case. There are probably plenty of people around, and what's more, though, I can't see them, they can all see me. <sighs> I take a deep breath to calm myself down. I have to act in such a way that people around me won't be able to tell that I'm blind and deaf to their presence. If I take too long, it'll be time to go to school and some of my classmates might walk by. That would be bad. I'll have to do this carefully, but also as quickly as possible. What are we going to do? Oof. I bought some onigiri and bread at the convenience store, making sure to pay exactly so the cashier wouldn't try to give me change. It was really strange, but the checkout counter looks completely empty and motionless to me the whole time. It seems Mana's Kododama is selectively erasing all information that might indicate a person's presence to me. The only hint that something was happening was the sounds of the cash register. It's an odd thought at a moment like this, but I can't help but be impressed at the sheer quality of the Kododama. I did briefly consider closing my eyes and trying to make my way around by hearing alone. My ears seemed like, uh, er, seemed like my least affected sense, excuse me, so I thought it might work and tried it out for a minute. But I quickly realized how much I rely on my eyes in daily life. It might not be possible or impossible to navigate blind, but even if I used my Kododama to make it easier, it would take forever to get used to. Well, at least I got what I came for. Breakfast. I take out an onigiri, unwrap it, and start to eat it. I must have been hungrier than I realized because the onigiri is gone within seconds. Maybe I should have waited until I got home. No, if I ate in my room, Mana might be woken up by the smell of the food. What time is it now, anyway? I take out my cell phone, or take my cell phone out of my pocket, and look at its clock. That's only a short while before everyone will start walking to school. If I stay outside for too long, one of my fellow students might see me. I start to eat one last onigiri before going back inside, when suddenly it hits me. Wait a second. I stare at my phone. What would happen if I called someone? Just now at the convenience store, I could hear the sounds of the cash register. A phone is a machine too. Maybe I can hear human voices as long as they're over the phone. I don't know, because it's still perception of somebody, you know, talking to you. Somebody's existence. But the voice we would hear would be digitized, or not necessarily digitized, but encoded into electrical signals and therefore brought to our phone. I don't know how phones work, but yeah, it, it wouldn't technically be the person speaking to you. It would have been through different signals. I'm fully prepared to go along with Mana until she relents and cancels her Kododama. I don't want to trick her or cheat my way out of this, but I'm concerned that Kokoro and the others might be worried about me. 
it might be worth or worth it to at least try and see if I can contact them. Here it goes. I steal myself and select Kokoro's number from my address book. Unfortunately, I can tell that her phone has stopped ringing and my screen says the call is connected, but I can't hear her voice on the line. Apparently I still can't hear her voice even over the phone. Mana's Kododama really is something else. I'm alright, don't worry about me. I'm not sure whether she could hear me or not. Mana did say that she had spoken Kododamas to both Kokoro and Azuki-san too, but I try to let her know that I'm safe or anyway before I hang up. Right, what about texting? Mana's Kododama can't stop me from reading and writing texts, can't it? What the heck is this? I open a text that Kokoro sent me a while back and my jaw drops. I can tell that there is some kind of text on the screen, but it's blurry, and I can't tell what it says at all. My brain must be recognizing this text as Kokoro's words, and then ignoring it just as Mana's Kododama commands it to. That's so cool. Like, it's fucked, but I really dig how deep this Kododama can go. Because it is all perception. It, the Kododamas have always affected the mind, and the mind can affect your senses. So now we can't see anything that has to do with anyone, straight up. If this is how Kokodo's texts look to me, she probably won't be able to read any text that I send her either. I almost feel dizzy as I keep thinking. Mana has been in the house since yesterday and hasn't gone to school. That means that she hasn't been able to speak a Kododama to anyone other than Kokodo and Azuki-san. I think she's told the school via Kokodo that she'll be homesick for a while. That means that my place at school and my place in this world haven't crumbled away just yet. But the longer this drags on, the more precarious my position will be. For, for so many reasons, it's time to do or die. I hear Mana's voice behind me. I put my phone back in my pocket and turn around. I was hungry, so I thought I'd go buy some breakfast. I show her the shopping bag with the remaining bread and onigiri in it. I would have apologized before making excuses, but I can't, because her Kododama telling me not to apologize is still in effect. Her eyes widen in surprise. Yeah, it was kind of nerve-wracking, but I managed to do it. She really wants us to rely on her, but we're also our own person, and we have to make our own decisions. She has to realize that as well. This isn't completely, you know, all for her. This is also something for us. Or, I guess I should say it's not one-sided. You were sleeping so peacefully that I couldn't bear to wake you up. Her face screws up as if she's about to start crying. And then she suddenly wraps me in a desperate hug. I won't. I can't apologize directly, but I try to sound as contrite as I can as I stroke her hair. I should have just gone home quickly instead of doing all these stupid experiments with the phone, closing my eyes. <laughs> she suddenly looks down, presses her temples, and groans softly. Mana, what's wrong? I bend down to look at her face. There's a film of sweat on her forehead, and she's grimacing in pain. Does your head hurt? Let's go inside quickly. She mutters to herself and then slowly looks up again. It's the same shit. When we were casting all those Kododamas before we uh, decided to cast one big old Kododama on Azuki, it's the same shit. Her expression is back to normal, but her face is still horribly pale. Her skin, normally fair, is balanced white, the color of snow. You can say that, but you don't look one bit fine. She turns her face away from me, pouting like a little kid. It's a cute gesture, but right now that makes it all the more uncomfortable to look at. Mana, that headache, it's probably because... She glares sharply at me. I, I know. 
The adults in the village intentionally never taught me the proper use of Kododama, but Mana always knew about the dangers. So I know that she's always careful and only speaks of Kododama when she's fully prepared to do so. It's just... But have you ever been this drained after speaking of Kododama? Naiwa. I knew it. That means you're in unknown territory now. So yo. So ga nan da te yu no? At this rate, your headache will just get worse and worse. Though she has more experience with Kododama than I do, I'm sure I've come closer to death when using it than she has, so I know. And it's not just that. You'll feel completely exhausted and nausea will come over or come soon after. Eventually, you won't be able to do so. She finally starts to look worried. Yeah, you don't totally lose your Kododama power, but it starts going weird. That's only natural, though. Erasing your pain with a Kododama doesn't actually make the damage go away. <laughs> yeah, remember, like, way earlier on, he was like, you know, I'm kind of curious. How bad is it? And so he removed the Kododama, and he just, like, it hit him like a truck. She hugs herself while she thinks. Mana, hey, let's stop this, okay? The longer these Kododamas last, the more strain it will put on you. I'm worried about you, Mana. Uso. She looks at my pocket, her gaze becoming sharp again. Yeah. I nod and take my phone out of my pocket. I can't very well deny it at this point. Her face darkens as she scrolls through my call history. And this just when she had started to recover from the sudden headache. Yeah, but I couldn't hear anything and I couldn't read any of the text messages. She puts my phone away, looking irritated. Apparently, it's getting confiscated indefinitely. This is bad. I can see the distrust in her eyes. Her tone becomes colder and colder. I just wanted to tell her not to worry. I take Mana's hand, trying to find some way to get back into her good graces. She and Azuki-san probably think I've just suddenly disappeared, right? She nods. As I thought. She looks at me sadly. Oh, come on. No, you can't. I can't let her do that. But what can I do? She's sealed my own Kododama, so I have no way to stop her. There's only one way. Mana, I'm begging you. I squeeze her hands desperately. <laughs> she smiles bewitchingly, and a, a shiver runs down my spine. Ah, uh, yeah, buddy. She steps forward, closing the distance between us as she squeezes my hands in return. But what should I do? How can I reassure you? She places one hand on my chest. You are. That's why I'm so worried about you. All I can do now is plead with her and hope she relents. She looks at me meaningfully. Not at all. I really just don't know what I should do. I'm at my wit's end. I'm about to fall to my knees in frustration. Will nothing I say reach Mana's heart any longer? <laughs> With a smile that's half sadistic and half loving, she gently touches my cheek. 
あなたを絶望させたいわけじゃない。ただ、自分を取り戻してほしいだけなの。あなたがこれから、きちんと私の望みを叶えてくれるなら、新しい言霊を使うことは、控えると約束する。ふ、hmm, ーん、I don't like this promise。なんて、我ながら大雨な情報だと思うけど、どうかしら But it is a way to build trust. It's a promise, not an order through Kododama. Promises, such as what we made with Hotodu in the beginning. But man, the way that she's going about this, I'm not a fan of. But also, I'm not a fan of what Makoto did that got him into this situation. Honestly, this whole deal is fucked. So yeah, I'm a little disgusted by Mana's behavior, but I'm also disgusted with how Makoto went about things, to be totally frank with you guys. I've been happy to see Mana start to read manga, eat donuts, and becoming friends with Kokodo and Kyoko. She seems to be enjoying herself more than she, when she was back in the village. And she probably thinks similarly about how I've changed here, too. Of course, I want to grant your wishes. I also want us to get out of this situation. For my sake and hers. If words aren't enough, what else do I have to do? She laughs and then brings her mouth close to my ear. Then. I mean, I can't say I'm surprised. I felt like it was going in that direction. Her, her soft voice carries no Kododama this time, and she draws me by the hand. Well, I have an idea as to what's coming up here. And yeah, yeah, it, uh, <laughs> it really, it really just like jumped right into it. Jesus Christ. That was fun. That was educational, I would say. I don't think anything crazy happened there that is notable. I open my eyes. It seems I've been sleeping for quite a while after we finished making love, or after we did. It's already evening, huh? I look around and realize that Mana isn't in the room. Did she go back to her room to sleep, or maybe she's already awake and has gone somewhere? <laughs> There she is. <laughs> Mana returns, flapping the front of her yukata to fan herself. While I was sleeping, she took a bath to wash off the sweat. Among other things. But looking at her face, she doesn't seem refreshed. In fact, she looks even more tired than before. Well, yeah, I mean, that, that, was, a, that was a cardio type of、uh, activity that we just got done with. Coming up to the bed, she sighs and lies down next to me. As she walks, she's almost dragging her feet on the ground. With Mana in this condition, maybe it wasn't a good idea for us to have sex. Are you okay? You're starting to look pale again. <laughs> Her eyelids slowly close. Mana. Within moments, her breathing becomes deep and regular, and she doesn't answer. I gaze at her sleeping face for a while. It might make me feel impatient. It might make me feel inadequate, but for now, I just have to do what I can. And that means sleep as well. That's what I do whenever I can't figure out what to do. I just close my eyes and throw it all, the, throw it all away and deal with my,、uh, my demons, my sleep paralysis demons. They do show up a lot. I don't think that's a good thing. A sudden chill on the back of my neck wakes me up. Outside the window, the summer sun is blazing in the bright blue sky. But inside this room, it's almost as if winter has arrived. I can almost forget that I'm in bed under the covers. <laughs> Mana stirs in my arms. Her face is still pale, but she doesn't seem to be in pain at least. Yeah, apparently. Frowning slightly, she hugs me a little tighter. She doesn't seem to be awake yet, so she must still be dreaming. It's alright, Mana. I'm right here. I whisper in her ear as I hug her in return. She entwines her legs with mine. The touch of her feet is pleasantly ticklish and cool. Her expression softens as she lets out a sigh. 
Then slowly she returns to the steady breathing pattern of deep sleep. While relieved that she seems to be comfortable, I'm alarmed at how much colder I'm feeling today than yesterday. The amount of snow I can see around Mana's body has definitely increased too. I think it means that her snow curse is gaining the upper hand over her. In other words, she's weakening. And accordingly, her resistance to the Kododama that was placed on her long ago is also weakening. It's incredible that, no that Nozomi's Kododama could still persist so many years after her death. To say that her Kododama ability was orders of magnitude greater than mine would be an understatement. And Mana, while not reaching Nozomi's level, is still one of the strongest Kododama users in the history of the village. To them, my Kododamas are mere child's play, and to me, theirs are like the works of gods. I decide to stay in bed and keep Mana warm, at least until she wakes up. She might never know that I made that decision, but I'm not doing it for show. Even if she never cancels her Kododama. Even if she tries to force me to go back to the village with her. She's still a very precious person to me, and she's one of the people I want to be happy. And so... Good night, Mana. Honestly, I'm not very sleepy anymore, but I close my eyes anyway, a bit forcedly. As I drift off to sleep, I pray that she will find peace. Well, don't say it like that, because... You know, we want to be on the cautious side when it comes to Mana and her curse. Alrighty, uh, we'll end the episode here. This seems like an okay place. I don't know when we're going to get out of this mess, hopefully soon, because when it's just the two of them, uh, th there's a lot more talking that I have to do. A lot more narration from Makoto, his thoughts and what he's saying and everything. Because there's, there's really nobody else here to pick up the slack. It's all me. Um, yeah, I, I don't really have too much to say. I'm a little pissed at uh, Mana for the way that she's going about things. And that was definitely made evident here at the end of this episode. But, again, Makoto really did fuck up. Something I can't agree with, so... I don't know. I guess this is, uh, this is how they repair things. It's just throwing mud at each other. Well, thank you all for watching this episode. If you enjoyed, be sure to leave a like, subscribe, all that fancy jazz, and I will see you all in the next one. Take it easy.